Regular viewers of Common Council meetings on City Channel 26 will recognize City Clerk Ron Leonard. He has a prominent role at each meeting, announcing the topics to be considered acting as parliamentarian. The City Clerk is chosen in an election by members of the Common Council. He directs the office and personnel that serve as support staff for the 17 Council members. Common Council members are elected on a nonpartisan basis, that is, they run without party label. The 17 districts they represent each contain about 37,000 people. Council members are legislators enacting laws helping to shape city policy. They are also service coordinators working to maintain the quality of service in their districts. Most of their work is done at the committee level. As I mentioned, the legislative work of the Common Council is supported by the Office of City Clerk. And joining me now as we learn more about our city government, City Clerk Ron Leonard and Council Administration Manager Anthony Zielinski. Welcome to Insight Milwaukee, first of all. And let's find out a little bit first of uh, exactly what the City Clerk's office is all about. Well, the City Clerk actually is one of the oldest professions in, in, in government. Um, the, the office of, of clerk um, is sort of the, the basic office for keeping the records of city government. And in many smaller communities, uh, not only in Wisconsin, but throughout the United States uh, and all of the English-speaking countries, uh, the clerk is sort of the focus point of, of government. And um, basically, in, in many cases where the elected officials are part-time, actually runs 
most of city government. In the larger cities like Milwaukee, the, the role of the, of the clerk is a, is a little narrower. Uh, in our case, we are principally a support organization for the legislative function, for the elected officials, the members of the Common Council, uh, providing uh, office support to them, uh, supporting the process of making legislation, uh, and providing public information services to the public. Tony, let's talk a little bit about your role in the city clerk's office. Uh, my role, uh, Tom, is uh, uh, my council administration manager, and I head a division within the city clerk's office known as the council services division, which is comprised of approximately 30 employees and has four sections. And we provide support staff to the 17 members of the common council. Uh, if uh, I may, I'd like to go over uh, the four sections that uh, are within uh, uh, my division. And the first one is the uh, council section, which provides uh, uh, minute taking, uh, sending out of uh, notices for various standing committees, uh, recording of uh, various actions, uh, and making sure that the proper people are notified for the hearings. The act is uh, parliamentarians to the uh, uh, chairman of each of the standing committees. Uh, the second section is the clerical section, which provides uh, uh, secretarial support to the uh, 17 members of the Common Council. They do correspondence, they do mailings, etc. And we have four council secretaries. The uh, third grouping is the uh, uh, would be the uh, public relations and communication section, which handles the speech writing uh, for the council members, the publications such as newsletters uh, for the various members of the council, and of course there would be Channel 26, which televises almost all of the uh, standing committee meetings, as well as special committees and other uh, bodies, as well as producing uh, various programming. The uh, last section uh, would be the uh, uh, community services section, right. uh, which basically handles neighborhood complaints uh, and the mediation of them. And those complaints come from a variety of people uh, within the private sector as well as the older persons themselves. People can contact that section at any time with, with almost any kind of a problem. Could be a problem from a howling dog to a tree overhanging in another neighbor's yard to just two people verbally uh, uh, harassing each other. Okay. Let's talk about some of the other divisions, Ron, that you are responsible for. Uh, one of those divisions being central administration. What is that all about? Well, the central administration is sort of the core group of staff uh, within the department that handles uh, administrative services for the three major divisions. Uh, Tony mentioned the council services division. We also have the legislative reference bureau and the license division, which I can uh, talk about a bit. Uh, the central administrative staff handles payroll functions, personnel functions, budgeting, uh, accounting, computer services, switchboard functions, those sorts of uh, just running an organization in an office and uh, those services apply to all three of our divisions. Uh, the Legislative Reference Bureau um, is composed of both a library and research staff. The, it was originally created as the Municipal Reference Library I believe in 1903 making it one of the oldest such organizations in the United States. Um, and for a while it was a branch library of, of, city, of the uh, Milwaukee Public Library System. It is a library in City Hall which maintains uh, records of um, city departments. Uh, any material which had been published by any department uh, is, is kept in the uh, historical collection in the uh, Legislative Reference Bureau and is available to members of the public to come in and use to do historical research on the city of Milwaukee as well as research on current issues. They also maintain an extensive uh, uh, newspaper clipping collection, have access to online databases, can gather a lot of information for uh, city departments to use uh, as, as they research issues and for members of the Common Council to use as well. Um, the, the library is located in the basement of City Hall and is open to the public daily from 8 a.m. to 4.45 p.m. and is staffed by professional librarians. They also prepare resolutions and ordinances and things like that Correct. for council the, members. How many, of, how many of those do they do in a year? Um, the research staff drafts several hundred proposals of ordinances and, and resolutions during the course of the year. Um, 
not all ordinances and resolutions are provide, draft by our staff. Any city department can draft a resolution and submit it to the Common Council. But we do provide professional drafting services uh, through our research staff. And they also, uh, besides drafting those proposals, do a lot of background research for members of the Council on issues that are of concern to them, uh, whether it be transportation issues, crime issues, health issues, etc. Um, most recently, in 1988, the Common Council created a, a fiscal section as a part of the Legislative Reference Bureau, and this staff provides budgetary analysis and fiscal analysis services to the Council, uh, sort of the counterpart to the, to the Budget Office, which provides those services for the Mayor. The um, third division within the Department is our License Division, which probably has uh, the greatest contact with members of the public mm -hmm. of our three offices in the sense that um, over a hundred different types of licenses for operating various types of businesses in the city of Milwaukee are issued by the license division. Uh, many of those licenses require common council approval to be issued, uh, such as uh, licenses uh, for liquor establishments, bartenders licenses, taxi cab drivers, um, house moving permits. There's a, a, quite a variety of types of licenses which are handled uh, by that office and that's on the first floor of City Hall uh, and again is open from 8 a.m. to 445 daily. Many of the functions of each of those divisions have to do with communication with the public and dealing with the public. Let's talk about how communicating has changed in the City Clerk's Office with the computers and all the new high-tech things that are coming in. Well we certainly have had a revolution I think uh, and we haven't eliminated paper as a way of communicating. Uh, certainly, uh, we do provide um, legal notices through the newspapers and by posting on various bulletin boards within city government of notices of meetings and events that are going to be occurring. We make sure that the media are advised of things uh, that are going on in city government, not only for the Common Council, but other boards, commissions, and committees of city government um, who are required to provide public notice of all their meetings. Um, we are now able to, in addition, use the services of uh, television with Channel 26. Um, and um, we're beginning to look at ways to use computers to communicate with the public as well. Um, email is becoming a, a, a way of communicating. Uh, the city is posting a lot of information on a public information service called OmniFest, run through the, the uh, UWM. And again, um, it's our staff within the Legislative Reference Bureau that is putting that information on OmniFest, working with various city departments to provide a lot of information there. And that is accessible at a very low cost to members of the public and can also be accessed at any of the uh, Milwaukee Public Libraries. Um, just recently now, the city has established its own website on the World Wide Web, and members of the, the public can access city government online now uh, at www.ci.mil.wi.us, City of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, United States. And we're right there on the web, not only for members of the public, but people throughout the world to get a picture of Milwaukee city government and get a, quite a bit of information. Uh, perhaps at this time of year, people might be most interested in uh, some of the tax information and assessment information that is available mm -hmm. online about uh, their own property. Let's talk about the things that people communicate with the city about. One of them, I would think, would be legislative matters, things they would like to see done, things they would like their aldermen to do. Uh, Tony, how does, how does someone go about becoming involved in the legislative process? How does a law begin? Okay, there are a number of ways it uh, could begin, uh, Tom. Um, if a citizen, for instance, has an idea of how to change a law, that it could be more effective. Uh, there are a number of things. They could write a letter directly to the Common Council and that eventually would go to the Council President John Cowitz and would be reviewed by him. They could contact their local older person uh, directly and say, I've got this idea. What do you think we should do about it? And uh, so I think the older persons are probably the closest to the grassroots, the people within the community and uh, they can call them at any time, they can write letters, and if, they feel, uh, if the older person feels it's a good idea, it would be introduced. It could be sponsored by the alderman, or as a courtesy, uh, uh, it could be introduced by the chair, which is the, actually the Common Council president, 
uh, and then it would be going through a hearing process. So the average person can get legislation introduced by contacting uh, their local older person. Depending on the topic, it depends upon where which committee it goes to. What happens at the committee level then? It's introduced as a what's known as a common council file uh, at a regular meeting of the common council, and uh, then it's referred to a standing committee. And there are seven standing committees of the Common Council, each having a certain jurisdiction over a subject matter. Um, it's Common Council President John Kalwitz who determines what committee it goes to based upon the Common Council rules and procedures. After a file is introduced, and believe it or not, we have about 2,000 Common Council files per year that are introduced. Uh, after it's been introduced, it goes to a particular standing committee they usually refer the file out for a study to a particular department to see if it has merit. And after the report comes back, it is normally scheduled for a public hearing in which the um, petitioner is notified as well as any interested parties. After the public hearing is held on it, then the committee uh, determines whether, um, by vote, whether it's a good proposal or it's not a good proposal. Uh, they, if they recommend passage, it would then go to the next Common Council meeting. Uh, they would take a vote on it. If the council passed it, it would then go to the mayor's office for his signature, his veto, or his non-signature. But that's basically how it goes through the process. The petitioners <clears throat> have a lot of different things that they'll bring before the council. And we were talking earlier about uh, some of the issues that have come from the public. And maybe you could give us a couple examples, Ron, of those recent issues in which the public has has prompted some action by the Common Council? Oftentimes those issues uh, relate to neighborhood matters uh, and may stem from uh, community organizations um, or perhaps business organizations. Uh, the redevelop of Mitchell Street for instance uh, which had been turned into a more of a pedestrian mall and now has been reconverted back to more of an open street for, for business purposes. Those changes really were initiated by the people who live and work in that area and it mattered to them. Currently there, there, there has been a, a study going on of um, alcohol beverage licensing in the city of Milwaukee and that task force which was uh, created by the Common Council was originally a proposal and request from community organizations concerned about uh, issues regarding alcohol beverages and licensing issues in the city and um, encouraged that a study uh, be created and me members of that a lot of members of those community organizations are now part of that task force actually participating in the process themselves. And a lot of times these issues even come forward from people who can't vote and we have an example of that. Uh, it was an action which originated from a group of students actually at Riverside High School about two years ago when they petitioned to change the name of a street. This is a celebration of a bit of Milwaukee history and of a group of Riverside University High School students making history. A story of a Milwaukee street changing its name and of the heroics and courage of Joshua Glover, a slave, and Sherman Booth, a newspaper man. It happened because of a history lesson on the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Whenever I told the, the Glover Booth story, uh, uh, invariably one or more kids would say, well, is there a Glover Street? And my answer would be no, and then the next question is always, or was always, why not? And I'd shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. Well, this year I said, well, let's try to find out and let's try to do something about it. And they did do something about it. But before we tell you what they did, a look at why they did it, with a brief history lesson for the rest of us. It was a big story locally, happened right here in downtown Milwaukee. We know it today as Cathedral Square, but in the 1850s it was the site of the former Milwaukee County Courthouse and the county jail. Sherman Booth was an abolitionist newspaper editor in Milwaukee who tried to stop the recapture of slaves in free states. The Milwaukee County Jail held a fugitive slave from St. Louis by the name of Joshua Glover. Captured, jailed here after working for two years in a Racine sawmill. According to newspaper accounts, Booth, who is shown on a horse in this illustration, led as many as 5,000 people in battering down the jailhouse door. Glover was freed and fled to Canada. 
Little is known about Glover after that, but the incident led to a national debate on the Fugitive Slave Act. Sherman Booth, who was himself jailed after the Glover escape, was later pardoned by President Buchanan. Booth Street was named for him three years later. Now, nearly 140 years later, Glover is joining him. Earlier this year, students from Charles Cooney's history class at Riverside went before the Common Council's Public Improvements Committee to appeal for the street name change. It's necessary for a positive step <clears throat> towards equality for minorities and a tribute to the man who risked his life to achieve it. And I would like to see this proposal passed so that I can proudly say I was a part of history and the hard work and determination that comes behind it. Justice and equality are still abused ideas, and that's why it's good to know that people, even old, not even old enough to vote, still can influence government with high concepts and noble purposes. A street name is all we're changing, but as a butterfly can influence global weather, so too to change our neighborhoods and city. The committee, then the council, approved of the idea. The students had been skeptical, doubted city government would respond. Their teacher said it had been a good lesson. I am very proud of these students, obviously. Um, and I'm also very proud today to be a, a resident of this city, and I'm proud of this government for responding the way it has to a group of young people, many of whom, as Alan and several other people said, don't have the franchise yet. And uh, I think this is a, a wonderful demonstration of uh, how government can respond to felt needs. Of heights, guys. <laughs> We're all here to catch you. It was important to the students that the proposed Glover Street intersect with Booth. And this summer, after months of letter writing and convincing residents along the short section of Reservoir Avenue to agree, they accomplished what they set out to do. Individuals can make a difference in city government, and there is a great example. Another one mentioned in a, a history of the city of Milwaukee. Uh, Many, uh, quite a number of years ago, a group of students from Edison Junior High School were instrumental in having the uh, city propose an ordinance and uh, enact it, which uh, requires photo IDs on city employees and also members of the uh, of uh, utilities. So they must wear photo IDs because of an action by a group of students a number of years ago. Let's talk about the, the ways in which aldermen communicate with their constituents. You talked about them being close to the grassroots. Uh, how, how do they communicate things to their constituents? Well, it is important to point out that the, the aldermen who are elected every four years um, are the representatives of the people of their district, and they are very concerned, obviously, about the issues that their constituents have and whether or not they're able to vote. Um, they, they are concerned about these matters. Otherwise, they wouldn't have run for office to begin with. Um, the communication is two-way. Obviously, people can contact their aldermen uh, by writing to them at uh, 200 East Well Street, room 205 City Hall, which is the city clerk's office, common council's offices. Um, they can contact them by telephone. Uh, our main switchboard number is 286-2221. And again, that is staffed from 8 a.m. to 445 during the day. But during any hour of the day, uh, the people calling that number will be transferred to a city hall operator who can take a message. And if there's an emergency, uh, an alderman can be contacted or appropriate city officials can be contacted to deal with emergencies such as water main breaks, etc., that citizens may be concerned about. Um, and obviously people are welcome to come down to our offices too and um, to get information and arrange meetings with members of the Common Council. The aldermen uh, communicate um, with their constituents um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, each of them have a full-time legislative assistant uh, who they select, whose primary role really is to handle constituent affairs within the office. So uh, when phone calls come in, it, the people may often speak with the legislative assistant. The alderman might be at a, at a meeting, for instance, and something not available at that time. The legislative assistant will uh, speak with the constituent uh, and make sure that their concerns are addressed and brought to the attention of, of the common council member. Um, people will receive phone calls from, from their uh, alderman, alderwoman, uh, 
letters. We do a lot of mailings. If there's an issue of concern uh, to a neighborhood organization or a particular segment of the community, we'll do a mass mailing to that particular area so that people are kept informed. Um, the Common Council members will also um, issue newsletters that go out to uh, all the residents of their districts several times a year, keeping them informed of um, new developments within their district, as well as some very basic information that the city wants to make sure that every household is aware of um, issues such as recycling and um, uh, noise regulations and various things that we know that uh, every, everyone in the community is concerned about. I mentioned the website earlier that the, that the city has started and um, all of the common council members have information uh, about their district on the website and in many cases, you can actually, um, through the website, send an email message to the alderman as well. So there's, there's even new methods of communicating with aldermen.